JP, huh? what is going on exactly? So the guys fight, fight, fight. Most will just come. A lot of gunshots. Um, in fact, I remember now JP took the camera and uh, he's trying now to get a shot of yeah, this too yeah what's happened. going on yeah that is literally dying to get exactly <laughs> exactly and i remember and remember his camera is not the small cameras it's, it's a huge one this big one in a kwa mabega and i babaivi you know it almost looks like a gun in itself so i remember now me i'm there i whip up my i whip out my phone and I'm also trying to capture with my phone the action. Yeah, and at the same time, I'm just like I'm panicked. I'd be lying to tell you if I wasn't afraid. The worst for me was Central African Republic. CAR. Yes, the CAR. Uh, this was in 2013, so the year after DRC. And I was in Congo. Xi Jinping, the president of China, had just become president. Mm -hmm. And his first maiden trip he did was to Africa. He came to, he went to South Africa, he went to TZ, and then he went to Congo Brazzaville. So I was assigned to cover him in Congo Brazza. And so I left with uh, a cameraman colleague of ours, JP. Mm -hmm. uh, Jean Paul. Jean Paul, yeah. So JP speaks French. I didn't at the time. Mm -hmm. So I needed him. Again, just the two of us. We go to Brazzaville. It was supposed to be a short trip because I think Xi Jinping was in Brazzaville for like three days only. But then while we were there, a coup happened in the Central African Republic. It's a neighbor to Congo Brazza. <laughs> Francois Bozizé was the president. He got up a throne. And the airport was taken over by rebels. And so there were no commercial flights going into Bangui. Bangui is the capital of CAR. And we happened to be in the neighboring country. So it was just natural for the team in Nairobi to call and say, hey, once you're done with your coverage of President Xi, could you cross over into CAR? And we we're like, yeah, I mean, Honestly, mm -hmm. I had, every journalist will want to yes, cover conflict. And I mean, it's a neighboring country, so yeah. I had no context of what you're going into. Exactly. And just how far these two countries are apart, even though they're neighbors. Like, I am supposed, I'm in the capital of Congo, the Republic of Congo, which is oh, Brazil. Close to Kinshasa. Yes. It's actually yeah. just divided by the Congo by River. By the Congo River. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I'm supposed to go to Bangui, the capital of the CAR. And in my mind, because they're two neighboring countries, yes. in my ignorance, I'm thinking, ah, but that's like uh, leaving Nairobi Happened and going to, to Kampala. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, that's a trip you can make yeah. very easily. Yeah. And Nairobi, so, Machakos. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, you cross the Busia border and yeah, boom, you are in you Uganda. Be, yeah. <laughs> and so that's what we thought. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, okay, no problem. So we finished our coverage of uh, President Xi. And then began the process of getting into, into the CAR. So we went to the embassy in Braza, the CAR embassy, embassy in Braza. We yeah. got our visa. It was very quick. And then we started now gathering information. So how do we get to Brazzaville from here? And so we were told, okay, uh, you need to get a flight from Brazzaville to mm -hmm. go to a small town mm -hmm. in the Republic of Congo called Imfondo. And then drive from Imfondo into uh, get into into the CAR and then drive from from the border into Bangui, the capital of CAR. Okay, so we think, okay, no worries, we, we are going to do that. Mm -hmm. So we get the visa, we start the journey. Mm -hmm. The flight to Imfondo happens only once a week on Thursdays. You miss so it? You miss it, you're done. You have to wait until the following week. So we get the flight, we fly into Imfondo. The whole time we are flying into Infondo, I'm telling you, Enoch, it's nothing but just vast, this huge forest. So it's just green, green, trees, trees, trees. And I remember when finally the plane was, take, was landing, 
I remember looking out and wondering, are we actually landing on top of trees? Because you can't see where you're going. You can't that's see the how, airport. No, no. And that's how huge that forest is. So we land, and, and the Republic of Congo is massive. Mm. And the population is very small. I mean, I think the whole country has a population of 5 million people. That's Nairobi's population. So they're very sparsely populated. So anyway, so we land into this small, it looks like a clearing, you know. We land there. The town is super small. It is so small because I think I googled it sometime last year. You know, sometimes you sit back and Google just pops up a picture mm -hmm. and it reminds you of where you are like 10 years this day. Yeah. And I remember a picture popped up and I thought, oh yeah, we were there. And I thought to Google the population of Imfondo. That was late last year. It was 100,000 people. So you can imagine in 2013 how many people were there. It was just a small clearing. Mm -hmm. So we landed and everybody was staring at us like we are aliens. I mean, because we stuck out like a sore thumb because we each had our suitcases of clothes. On top of that, we had the big camera. We you had a big gun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we, had, we had a big gun to help us go live. <laughs> and the, cam the batteries for this camera, because it was that big, I don't know what you guys call it, but it's that big, big camera. The battery each weighs, believe it or not, 1.5 kgs. So we had like a huge box mm -hmm. of these batteries that we'd carried, you know, to sustain us. And it's hot. It's super, super hot. So it dies out quickly. These batteries die out quickly because of the weather, you know. And so rather the phone, I mean, um, the camera, because, mm -hmm. you know, the camera is constantly working to cool itself. Yes. So, yeah, the batteries run out pretty fast. So we had like a huge box. So we had a lot of luggage. We had the big gun, like you mentioned. We had the tripod. We had the editing laptop. Like it was just a lot of luggage we had. And so people were looking at us like, who are these people? They could tell we didn't really belong there. Yeah. And so the head of the airport came. I didn't speak a word of French. Thank God for JP, he was there. So they come, sava, sava, blah, blah, blah. And JP explains who we are and where we are going. And the head of that airport called the regional manager of Airtel because the infrastructure there is almost non-existent. So the only other person who, according to this guy, the head of the airport there, who could be able to take care of us was the regional manager of Airtel. So he comes, he had a helix. And he's told, I'm leaving these people in your hands. They're traveling to, they're journalists, they're traveling to Bangui. Sort them out. So he was a really nice man. He got us some rooms. So <laughs> I remember the rooms were, they had to be cleaned first. Because, I mean, they hadn't been used in such a long time. Mm. So the rooms are cleaned, uh, small, small rooms. It wasn't really a hotel. It was... Just, I guess, somebody who had set up some room somewhere. And then, uh, so they went to get us somebody who could at least help us move from there to CAR. So logistics, you know, the person who could help with that. Mm -hmm. And then we went for lunch. So while eating in this kakibanda, uh, we are told, oh, by the way, usually you would drive from here to Bentiu. Bentiu is the border town now, yeah. still in Brazzaville, in Congo, Brazzaville. Uh, but now because it's the rainy season, the roads are cut off, so you can only travel via Congo River. So we are getting you a boat. So the guys with the boat come. So we need to now start negotiating uh, the price. And I look at the boat, it's a canoe. I mean, the one you row like this. <laughs> You're you expecting know? a motorboat. Uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> and and what arrived was totally different. Exactly, it's a canoe on Congo River. Look, and you have had stories of, of, of I, I watch <laughs> National Geographic Wild yeah. a lot, like I'm addicted to the channel. Yes, I know what lies in those waters of Congo <laughs> River. I mean, I know it's the, it's the second longest river after the Mississippi. Yes, and I know all sorts of animals that live there. I mean, this river, Enoch, you couldn't see the end of it while on this side of it. Why? It's like a an ocean. Big. It's huge. It's massive. It's it is not, not so huge. Yeah. Like, right. no, I'm not talking about the length. I'm talking about the width, you know? Crossing from this side, which is Congo Brazzaville, to the other side, which is the DRC. You cannot see. You can't see the end of that river. At least not from where we were. You couldn't see. It looked like an ocean, you know? 
And now you're thinking, I don't know how to swim, first of all, I have to tell you that. I have this huge phobia of water. But even if you know how to swim, such that's the thing, you know. But now, <laughs> the fact that I don't even know how to just... Makes it even worse. Exactly, you know. <laughs> so the guys come and they say, so we ask, how are we going to move? First of all, how far is it from here to Bentiu, which is the border town? And they say, it will take us the whole day. We have to leave at 6 and we'll get there in the evening. So uh, they get the engine of a motorbike and fix it on this canoe. It's to, a makeshift thing. Yes. And then they, they tell us, oh, and they charged us 1,000 USD just to make that trip on that canoe. And they had to carry jerry cans of fuel and they told us no food i mean because where are you going to go to the toilet you know so no food just carry carry things like just sweets you or something all day on a canoe yes <laughs> on congo river. congo river so okay we finish our plan arrangements and whatever whatever and they go so we have to go now to sleep it's in the evening this village in fondo was very interesting so it's in the middle of the forest. There's nothing, like infrastructure wise, nothing. So they run on the generator. It is switched off at 10 p.m. There's no network there. If you need network, you have to go up the hill on the fringe of the forest. That is where there was network. Yeah, so, to, to yeah, like you have to now get out of, see, it's, it's like, so the village, the village surrounded by the forest. The village is in the middle of the forest. But in that village, because it's a slope, then down there is the river. So next to the river is where people have built. And then now, there's no network here because it's a dip. So you have to like go up a little on the fringe of the forest because it's up the hill. So there's good reception. So that's the only place where you can make the phone call. But then the generator is switched off at 10 p.m. And our Sweet. negotiations, ah. yeah, went on and on and on and on until evening. So... We couldn't communicate with anybody. So now, this is day one after we've left Brazzaville. We can't communicate with anybody. Nobody knows where we are. So we go into the room. And I find that my cameraman and I had been assigned one room. And they put, I don't know if your channel allows for this kind of content, but they put, they put condoms for us there. And they put for us... <laughs> <laughs> and they put for us DVDs of blue movies, you know. <laughs> so in their minds, I guess we were just a couple yeah, that a perhaps couple, was on yeah. this wild adventure. Yes. So we had to now start tracing the guy who had done the thing, like cleaning up the room and told him, uh, no, we need each a room. And you could see the confusion on his face. is like, you, need, you mean you need two separate rooms? And we are like, yes. So anyways, so he went and fixed the second room. And so, yeah, we slept. The journey was beginning the next day at 6 in the morning. So we went to the bank. It was so foggy. You couldn't see anything. And the entire village, I kid you not, came to just say bye. And I remember telling JP, why is this village coming to say bye to us? I mean, they don't even know us. They must know something that we don't. I don't think we're going to make it to the other side. I think we'll die. Like, honestly, Enoch, I was convinced we were going to die on that river. Because it didn't make sense. Why should this whole village just come? They don't know us. Yeah. But they're just coming to say bye to us, you know? And I remember you are, JP... You like, why would they care? Yeah, like, why would they care, you know? We are strangers, and we are just passing by, you know? But they did come, and they said, Kwaheri, you know? And, and the thing is, while we were now, like, in the river... So it was interesting. So they placed us in our luggage and their jerry cans of fuel. They distributed them in that canoe to balance it. And then one of the guys sat, so the canoe is like this. One of the guys sat there in front. Then there was JP, then there was me. And then behind there were two guys. So the guy at the front, because it was so foggy you couldn't see, he would stand and he would do his hands like this, trying to peer into the fog, mm -hmm. trying to figure out like where the way is. And then he would point like this, to the guys at the back so that they can steer so the canoe in see. that. Ah. Yeah. And we were on that river, believe it or not, from 6 in the morning until 5 p.m. That is when we arrived in Bentiu, the border town. Is it one of the longest days that you have experienced? The longest? <laughs> must have been one of the days when I said the most prayers. You know, just telling God, please, please, please don't let us die in this river. You know, 
And you're just thinking, nobody knows where you are. Not the office, not your family. Nobody knows where you are because you can't communicate. Yes. There was no network. That whole day, and remember the previous day when we landed in Bentio, like there was no network. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Infondo. So, anyways, at 5 p.m., we get into Bentio. Bentio. Mm -hmm. So, Bentio, if you thought Infondo was remote, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, we were not prepared for Bentio. It was just a few wooden structures. But it's the border point. It is the border point. But Enoch, I have never seen such a border point. There's very little business that takes place in those areas between the two countries. Because these countries are massive, you know, and there's very little infrastructure. Most of that infrastructure is concentrated in just the bigger regions, you know. So Brazzaville, uh, Pua Noa, places like those. But in these very remote areas, and it, it's in both countries, mm -hmm. there's not much happening, you know. And CAR is extremely impoverished. So when you're talking about the border, it is so far away from the capital city that really there isn't much investment in terms of infrastructure that has been done. So there's not much trade. So these towns are almost dead. So we get there, just some wooden structures, um, a few permanent structures. But in total, really, it's, I don't even know how to, it isn't even a shopping center. Like it's, it's very remote. Mm. And so we get there, we assigned our rooms. Of course, majia kuoga nile unachemsha basin kwa karai, unaenda kwa bafu ya bao, unaoga tu mechuchuma, you know. Nakawa ni beridi, unarusha ni kama. Exactly. Exactly. The good thing is the fish is fresh because they just get it from the, from the river. And so when we got there now, the first thing was communication. How do we let people know where we are? Because this is day two since we left Brazzaville. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows where we are. So luckily, there was this Lebanese shop that was there. The guys had a satellite phone. They were charging a dollar a minute. So we went, contacted the people that we needed to talk to, and we told them. We said, um, this is where we are. Now, the office had told us, um, you do a budget of what you need, and then when you get to Bangui, mm -hmm. we send it to you via Western Union or MoneyGram. So all of this we are doing, you're literally now also calculating, okay, how much money do we have left? Because remember when we were living in Nairobi, it was not for CAR, it was for Brazzaville. Mm -hmm. We just had enough for Brazzaville. But thankfully, at least, what we had was sustaining us through all these extra expenses that we hadn't really anticipated. So the Lebanese guy says, okay, um, oh, I think somebody, I don't remember who it was, told us there's this guy who has a four wheel, he can take you to uh, CAR. So we go to the guy. The guy is like, I cannot get into CAR because of how things are there right now, but I can take you to the border. It is eight kilometers from Bentiu to the border. Mm -hmm. So we are like, but we can go right now. And they said, yeah, you can't go right now because the country has been overrun by rebels. So there's no government. There's no structure. There's no security. So we can only take you tomorrow. And from here, to cover those eight kilometers to the border, the guy charged us 400 US dollars to cover eight kilometers to the border. Eight kilometers, that is yes. of, there's over 40. Yes. Currently, it's more than 50,000 Kenyan shillings. Yes. For just eight kilometers to the border, and then from the border to Jipange. So we give the guy the cash. We got the room to sleep in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Zile za kitambo za plastic za meza. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Na mawa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is what they had. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Zile za shine. Uh -huh. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Na jag ya plastic kwa hapo na maji. Maji metoka kwa mto suwa na kwambe hini maji fresh. Yeah. So, we eat to Kalala. So, thankfully, before, while we were at the Lebanese shop, that Lebanese guy told us that there was another Lebanese friend of his who was working for an Italian one of those uh, Muzungus who are just felling trees and taking the timber into Europe. Mm -hmm. So the French government had announced that they were sending the military to ferry out their people from Bangui to France. So the Italian guy was taking advantage of that. He wanted to go to Bangui the next day so that he can get out. So the driver was called Mohammed, he's Lebanese. Mm -hmm. And so this Lebanese guy hooked us up with uh, Mohammed. And then Mohammed took us to the Italian guy because now Mohammed works for this Italian man. 
and we told the Italian who we are and where we're going and that we wanted a ride from him. Yeah. And so he was like, no problem. So we went back to claim our $400 from the guy. The guy was like, nilikuwa nisha badilisha into sefa, nilikuwa nisha ya kagari mafuta, so he just gave us half the cash. So we took it. I mean, at this point, we can, <laughs> we need every coin we can get. You know what I'm <laughs> So we took, we took the cash. So this is day two. Spend the night there. Day three, we get up. We start the journey from now bent you into car for those eight kilometers enoch it made sense why this guy was charging four hundred dollars hakuna barabara and that place rains every single day the roads are bad bad enoch only a four-wheeler can be able to go through the eight kilometer stretch Abba. It took us two hours to cover that eight kilometers to the border. Eight kilometers, two eight hours. Eight kilometers, two hours. And in between, you've heard of those famous dwarves in the Congo forest. Yes. We would see them peering out, looking at us like this. Every time the car passed, like they just stand on the edge of the forest and they'd look at you. I thought it was just a myth. Oh no, they exist. So we go, we get into CR, border completely unmanned. But the thing is, that whole journey is just forest 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 mm -hmm. it's an ending forest you know so we get to this river so when now congo river gets into central african republic it's changed into bangi river it is huge there's no bridge but there's an old rickety ferry on the other side so they do the whistling whew, that thing eh? mm -hmm. then they call the ferry the ferry takes 10 minutes to cross over then wana kwambia pimanisha gari vizuri so that sasa mwingie na hiyo gari it takes you another 10 minutes to get to the other side. Then to Kansas Safari. We got to Bangui at 5 p.m. We'd hidden the cameras, everything, because now when you're approaching Bangui, the rebels were everywhere. They were manning the checkpoints. So all our equipment had been hidden. Passports hidden. So we'd given Mohammed $200 per person because that's how much they were asking to give you access into Bangui. So we go into, into CAR. CAR speaks French. CAR is predominantly Christian. But the people we saw, the rebels that were there, were speaking Arabic. They were Muslims. So it raised a lot of questions. Okay, where are they from? <laughs> That's another whole story. <laughs> but we get into the checkpoints. You keep giving out the money, the money, the money. Finally, we were dropped into this hotel in Bangui. It had so many foreigners that were stranded. And so we get there. Now, remember Nairobi had said, we'll send you the budget once you guys get there. Mm -hmm. What nobody factored in was this country, because there's no government, everything is closed. So the banks are closed, shops are closed. Western Union. Everything is closed. And so we found ourselves stuck in that country for two weeks, living on charity. <laughs> and in the hotel where we were staying, they were very kind, those people. Where we were staying, they would give us food for free. The driver who was ferrying us around, JP had gotten a contact of somebody who was there. Um, the driver, he understood our situation. So he would drive us around for free. He'd give us, he owned a little shop. So he'd get us water that we would use the whole of, you know, during the day. And Enoch, what was happening in the CAR, it was horrible, let me tell you. It is a crisis that to this day, it started then, but to this day has never been truly resolved, you know? I mean, now there's relative peace, relative being the working I word here. They are, they are working with, even together with Chad on the new yeah. constitution or something like exactly. that. Yeah. But Enoch, people were getting killed. We interviewed this lady, she was a member of parliament, and she was telling us how she saw a child, a 13-year-old boy, wearing a t-shirt, written her party initials. And she called the boy, and she asked him who he was, and he said he'd come from the border of Chad and uh, CAR. He's Central African. And the rebels came. This is now what you hear of conscription. And this child, they killed everybody in his family. They took him at 13 years and they gave him weapons. And they would go, he was telling, she was saying, the boy was telling her that they would go to every home 
and they'd kill people. And the boy told this lady, the member of parliament, that in one of the homes they went, they killed the father of that family and they ate his shin, you know, the shin with fufu. Can you imagine? And that he was saying, oh, it's that very is, sweet. That is sad. Yes. Central Africa, the atrocities that have been committed there, I think people don't really know much about that because DRC has, the DRC conflict has been there for much longer than what has happened in the Central African Republic. Mm -hmm. But if you speak to some of our colleagues who've been there, they tell you they've witnessed people being knifed to death and chopped up into pieces, you know? And they've seen it happening firsthand. And it was horrible. The guy that we worked with, that very kind driver who took us round, the next time I went to see AR, the guy was dead. He was shot. Somebody went to his home, called him out, killed him point blank. And the wife saw me, the next time I went there, the wife saw me and she just burst out crying. She literally like wept. But the stories of CAR, we covered. So the thing was that now, unfortunately, because the rebels that were there were Muslim, the Christians now started arming themselves and now they were fighting back. And so I remember there was a whole place, you know, like for example, in Kenya, how we would associate Isli, the Isli part of in Nairobi, Nairobi Isli, yes. yeah, would associate it with having a lot of Muslims. Yeah. So they have something like that, some district they call PK5, and it's predominantly Muslim. And those Muslims were marooned. So there were two groups of people. One was called Seleka, uh, that was Muslim, and the other one was Anti-Balaka. So the Anti-Balaka now came as a result of the, the, the coup that happened because Remember when I told you the, the rebels that were there were not speaking French. Yes. They were speaking Arabic mm -hmm. and they were Muslim. Yes. So that's how that conflict unfolded. And so you'd find Muslims marooned and look, they were starving in their homes because they couldn't be able to get out and get food for their kids. It was terrible. People dying in their homes because they are dying of hunger. They can't get access to food, access to water, access to medicine, and they're dying. And when we went there, it was so fresh, the UN hadn't even set up there yet. So the UN just came shortly after we got in, yeah. But the stories that we told in CAR, I think for me, because for DRC, what I mean by order is that we were embedded with the National Army, you yeah. see? And so we witnessed the conflict, but somewhat from a safe kind of distance. In the CAR, there was a shield, some kind of a shield. In this, yes, in DRC. Yeah. In the CAR, it is just me and my cameraman, period, in the thick of things. There's no military. We never saw any military. I mean, the rebels came, Jeshi Katoroka, you know? Mm -hmm. Guys fled, Bozize fled. So it was, it was overrun, quite literally, by rebels. So new Jipange Uji So we would be somewhere... The, the, the rebels were called Seleka. Yes. So they had seized vehicles, anything they could see. They had seized them and they had branded them Seleka. And so everywhere you went, everywhere you looked, it was mm -hmm. just the rebels. Mm -hmm. They were staying in the same hotel where we were staying. They'd have their fights there, shoot at each other there. There was not a single moment where you would say you have a bit of quiet. It would be gunshots all around you gunshots, screams at night especially, you know? And you wouldn't really know, am I next or not? Or is there a stray bullet that will get me or not? And there was this one incident that really sticks out for me. It was an afternoon. Uh, we had fil finished our, f you know, filming. And so we had gone back to the hotel. I was editing. It was a hot afternoon. So like outside the hotel, like on the terrace of the terrace of the hotel. Yeah. So there were some tables and chairs. So that is where we were. And uh, a commotion started at the back of the hotel. But you know, because by this time now you're desensitized to these gunshots and whatever. Umezoea. Umezoea. <laughs> you know, I mean Umezoea. So you're, I'm there plugged into my earphones, editing, GP was just there, you know. And um, Kidogo, so I removed my earphones. I'm wondering what's going on. And I look up and JP was seated across me. Yeah. So my back is towards the entry, entrance to the lobby of the hotel. And JP's back is towards the gate. 
of the hotel. So I look up and I see this guy, one of the rebels, pointing an AK-47 at me, or at least that's what I thought. And the first thing that went through my mind was, why does he want to shoot me, you know? And then I heard a voice shouting at this guy from behind me, speaking in Arabic. And so I turn, and standing at the entrance to the lobby was the colonel who was fighting with this rebel, yeah. his soldier. Mm -hmm. Kumbe, they had started the war, Numaya Hoteli. Mm -hmm. The colonel had crossed the guy, the soldier, alikuwa mepitia nje ingine kutoka nje ya gate. But because they're still fighting and hurling insults at each other, the colonel amevuka mm -hmm. through the lobby. He's standing now at the entrance of the lobby. So he's right behind me. The soldier is right behind JP. So the soldier now wants to shoot at the colonel. And so now me, I'm stuck there in the middle, you know? And so now I take in this whatever, and then JP is like, Chini Ameza PK, so me, I duck under the table. <laughs> so we leave the laptop there, like I'm in Ameza, you know? And then, pa, 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 some commotion, the guy um, shot us in, I turn us to gun shots, pa, pa, pa. Then we crawled, you know, like we crawled from the table to another car room. Mm -hmm. The door had been opened for that room. Yeah. So we went in. At this time now, everybody has scampered for safety. JP, huh? what is going on exactly? <laughs> so the guys fight, fight, fight. Most will just come. A lot of gunshots. Um, in fact, I remember now JP took the camera. And uh, he's trying now to get a shot of uh, this too. Yeah, what's happening? going on? Yeah. He's literally dying to get Exactly. Us <laughs> exactly. And I remember, and remember his camera is not the small cameras. It's, it's the huge one. This big one. In my kalawapa kwa beggar and I babaivi, you know. It almost looks like a gun in itself. So I remember now me I'm there, I whip up my I whip out my phone. And I'm also trying to capture with my phone the action. Yeah, and at the same time, I'm just like I'm panicked. I'd be lying to tell you if I wasn't afraid. <laughs> what you'll hear in that video is Jesus like a million times, you know, because you're so scared. You know, and then. So then say the natural sound in your video is yourself shouting. It's me shouting. <laughs> And asking JP, and asking JP, JP, Gopi, talk up a komlango asikuane, you know. And so that was very common. Um, most but times. That moment, that moment. Yeah. Sorry, uh, maybe I will take you back. You are under the table. Mm. How kuona, maybe this is my end. If someone was pointing a gun at you, yes, yes you are a journalist, you are yeah. supposed to be brave. Yes. But. A gun is not a toy. This is not a toy. This is not a spoon. <laughs> this is not a hockey stick. <laughs> tell you. Yeah. That is why I told you I left the laptop. Actually, at some point, JP came back up to get his camera. I think at that moment, he thought as a journalist. For me, I left the laptop there on the table. I went under the table. The next thing, I crawled on my stomach and entered that room where the door was open. I left the laptop, laptop there. By a stroke of luck, it was untouched amidst all the chaos. But Enoch, I'd be lying to you. And that's why I told you, the video on my phone, you'll hear a lot of Jesus from me. Because <laughs> for me, at that moment, I'm just thinking, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. <laughs> you know, I don't want to die. No one knows. And your family doesn't know that you are uh, even in uh, CIR. No, because remember, you, you, are in... you can't get any SIM card from where? The whole country... Is under lockdown. Like it's shut down, Kabisa. People have closed their shops, banks are not operating. There's nothing that is existing in that town, in Bangui. Nothing. So up until this minute, we really didn't have. But I remember, oh yeah, I remember we got, uh, remember our driver owned a small shop? Yes. So yes, I've remembered. He got us some, some SIM cards and a bit of airtime. Yeah, so what we would do is you make a quick call because you're also trying now to conserve because if this runs out, then you don't know where you're going to get the next one. Yeah. So you make a quick call and say, oh, I'm in this country and this is what's happening, period. And you leave it at that. Did you ever communicate with your family at that point? Uh, no, not now after. Actually, let me tell you, that day, I didn't call anybody 
Because I think that day, first of all, the first thing you're thinking of is, what just happened? And then the second thing of, you're thinking of is, oh, but uh, Nairobi needs the story. <laughs> and there's a life cross plant. <laughs> After you recover from the shock, there's a life cross plant, and I also need to file this story. You have to have a quick recovery. Exactly. That's what I was saying. Remember when I told you in DRC, it was not until I boarded KQ that I started weeping. Like, it was just so many different emotions. But while you're there, you never truly have time to process what is happening. And that is what I've learned. Like, you truly never have the time to process. It's like you're a robot, you know? So at that time, what you need to do is survive. Okay, then I've survived. Then, oh yeah, I was editing a story because uh, we have a live planned at this time. And you know, Sierra is three hours behind Kenya. So if our news is at 8, the live is at 5 p.m. So you need to file your story. You need to get content for your live cross. And then after that is done, you're thinking, oh, by the way, tomorrow, we need to go to this place. We need to interview this person. We need, we need to capture this. So I found, for me, I never really had a moment to myself where you're processing this is what's going on because you know you're constantly just navigating the now you know what do i need to do now so now i need to leave after you leave that minute now i need to deliver a story you know yeah you know so it works like that it's it's surviving yeah. then telling a story exactly surviving then tell the story and then survive again tell the story it continues like that never once did i even think Oh, by the way, um, where are we going to get money from? It didn't cross our minds until when it was time for us to go back. And by a stroke of luck, things opened. We were due to come back to Nairobi tomorrow, and things opened today. So now this is the funny story. We go to the bank, and we need now, I mean, the whole budget has been sent, and it's in dollars. But the CFA there has tumbled so much against the dollar they put for us money in bags they were looking for bags we they didn't give you dollars money. they were no dollars we had to change the money from dollars to say far because yeah because now you have to give yeah uh, they have to give us you are living on a credit yeah we're living exactly <laughs> we have so many bills to pay you yeah, know yeah and we need the money this is two weeks in so you can imagine how much the bills had piled you know so well, it's after bags, 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 then now we started looking for people to carry the money for us, put in the car. But you know the funny thing is, Enoch, it's such, it's such a paradox, that situation. Nobody thinks of stealing from you. Nobody thinks of stealing. I think just like me, everybody's thinking of, I need to first leave, you know, before I can think of, oh, the first instinct is for you to survive, to live. And... Um, I don't know if it was captured in the camera, the story of the boy that I told. Mm. Yeah, this, this member of parliament, a lady we interviewed, and she told us a story of how she saw this boy in the street. He had a t-shirt emblazoned with a party, yeah. whatever, or, uh, the, the party initials. Mm -hmm. And so out of curiosity, she called him and she asked the boy who he was and uh, where he was from. He was 13 years old. He was from a village near the border with the boy, Chad. Yeah. He'd been conscripted by the rebels, and they had walked from that border in Chad. I mean, you need to look it up in the map and just see the distance they covered. To Bangi. To Bangi. And along the way, they would kill. He was armed. They would kill. And he said how they went to this home. They killed the father of that family. They ate his shin. Shin, this part of the leg. They ate it Where? with fufu. And the boy said, the meat was so good. He also ate the meat. He ate the meat, yeah. I mean, there's nothing else to He eat. had no choice. Yes. He's a young boy. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what he was put under by those rebels. They mess up with the minds of kids. They mess you up so much, Enoch, that... And I think that's why I said it affected me more than the DRC. It wasn't just me feeling I'm in danger constantly. Because, you know, in DRC, I had a place to retreat to in the evening. But here, where could you go? There was no place that was safe. Where we were staying, the rebels were staying there. There's no police, there's no military, there's no government, there's nobody to protect you. But on top of that, it's also seeing what these rebels were doing to the community, you know? And it's unfolding in front of your eyes, you see? And you have to tell the story. And you have to tell the story. And you know, it's, it's terrible because 
you interview these people while they themselves are processing what's going on in their lives. So, you know, last night somebody came, killed a whole family, maybe two children survived, maybe a neighbor took them in, the neighbor lost his kids, you know, and you have to talk to these people. This didn't happen last week. It happened when it was dawning, when the day was breaking and you go to them and they show you, you still see blood on the floor, you know? So they- are When you see blood, you know that this is the life that was taken. Exactly. This is death that took place here, just a few hours back, you know? And the people that did that, they walk in front of you. One time we were setting up for a life cross with JP and I'm there, he set up his camera and the rebels just come and they stood there. They want to appear. They want to, they want to talk to you but you can't speak their language. So, you know, that also puts you now in a precarious situation because you're not pressure. communicating. Yeah. And, and a lot of pressure. Yes, because JP tried to speak French with them. They didn't speak a word of French. It was Arabic. Yeah, we Arabic. didn't speak Arabic. Yeah. So you try to borrow a few words from Swahili that are similar to Arabic, but still no context, you know? Sign language so that wasn't is what, coming Yeah, through. that is what we were resorting to. <laughs> Sign language, try and get a map of Kenya for them to understand you're not even from this country. Right? Because remember, these are Africans. They look just like you. Yes. So how do they know who you are? You know? Mm -hmm. So you show them the logo, say China. They try mm -hmm. to understand, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Then show the flag of Kenya. Me, Kenya, you know. They say, okay. They understand you're not from that country, so they let you go. So, Perina, uh, listening to you, someone would get to a point and realize that you've literally survived uh, to tell these stories in some, some of these countries you've visited. And yet you still go there. Last year you were in Central Africa Republic. And in Chad. And in Chad, covering a story about the Sudan conflict. Yeah. What, what keeps you and makes you still go there? Would someone say, is it because you are employed as a journalist or... Is there something else that pushes you to tell this story? I'll tell you what. And this is something I have seen in very many countries that I've covered. Because I covered CAR. And remember what I told you, the CAR conflict to this day is still happening. Just recently, when AFCON was going on, what did we see? The Congolese players protesting that their conflict is not really getting the mileage that it should be getting. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate bit is that the African story is told by non-Africans. And so we are at their mercy. You see, if some, I mean, Ukraine erupted, how many years ago did it? Ukraine is still making news to this day. Headlines. Yes, every single day. But Africa story but is... Africa, a, Sudan is fizzling out right now mm -hmm. as we speak. Yeah. It's not getting the headlines that it should be getting. And look, I was in Chad last year, May, to cover the Sudanese that have gone into Chad, you know? And the stories, we went to the refugee camps. And by the way, I'll let you know, we were there when the UNHCR was actually setting up the camps because of how fluid the situation was. So it wasn't like Kakuma in Kenya where the infrastructure is already there. No. The crisis is unfolding. So it was the from UN ground is, zero. Yes. You know, and the UN is simultaneously, you know, trying to deal with this conflict, trying to get funding from donors who, by the way, are not responding the way the UN would want because mm -hmm. they're That's saying, oh, but you know, there's Ukraine, you know, uh -huh. and all these, also this, you see, you see what I mean? So for me, going to these countries has nothing to do with the fact that I'm a journalist. If today I'm not employed by any media house, I will come and tell you, by the way, Eno, can we partner and can we go and do these stories? Why? Because these people are me, Enoch. They look like me. The reason why that rebel will come to me when I'm doing a live and want to know who I am is because he can't tell me from a Central African Republican. I mean a Central African. You know what I mean? Yeah. They are me. These are my people. And I'm here with the voice that they don't have. You know, when you say that, I remember when I was in Congo that the, when I was telling the, the story of the, the people who are suffering in IDP camps, I was, it was so devastating because a majority of these people were speaking Swahili. I could understand what they were saying. So I felt like this is my brother, this is my sister, this is my mother. I remember there was a lady I was seated with and 
we were talking and she told me how she left everything. She had to leave everything. And this story dots Africa. The story of conflict is in so many countries. And um, I'm happy that one thing that the African, all the African journalists who are coming out to tell these stories, and you are not just an African uh, journalist, you're a lady. You know, there's not so many ladies out there doing, um, let me say, doing conflicts, like for stories that are, are deemed to be, they were deemed those many days to be mannish. But today, you've told so many stories. What would you tell other journalists who are out there, probably, who haven't developed the urge to tell the African story? It's just simple for me, and why are you a journalist? What drove you into that profession? You could have picked any other profession. You have to know what made you want to be one, and you have to live up to that, that dream that you had. You don't want to be a journalist because you think you want to be famous. Far from that, you know. I actually don't think I'm famous anymore. I think I was more famous when I was at NTV than yeah. I am now, <laughs> you know. Yes. But it is now that I get the most fulfillment because now I'm able to tell people what is happening to my continent, to my people, you know. And I get to tell that story, by the way, on my terms, you know. And what I mean by my terms is that we're here, CGT in Africa, our business is Africa. We're not mixed with, oh, but in the midst of it all, you also have to go to Ukraine and you have to go to uh, Palestine. These are segments you know, meant for Africa. For Africa, you know. And so we have this segment every single day. As we wind up, uh, you've done stories of conflict. You've covered um, quite different stories, even climate change. But in the near future, what kind of stories would you like to tell about Africa as a journalist? I would like to tell a story of Africa, of an Africa that has come from the ashes. I think for me, having witnessed these conflicts way too many times, you know, way too many times, I would want that to change. There's a time we had peace in DRC and I thought, oh wow, I remember talking to some friends of mine and saying, back in 2012, had anybody told me the East would be stable, I'd have said, you're lying. But they did have some, some, some peace. Now it's erupted again. Mm -hmm. But then for how long shall we keep on telling these stories? You know, in 2020, I was in Burkina Faso talking about conflict. You see, now it's done. Goodness knows what else it will be tomorrow. But can we then as Africans also say we are prioritizing ourselves? We are taking care of ourselves. So can we stop with the conflict? Because who's fighting? We are fighting one another, you see. Yeah. No one is coming from outside. No, no, no. Yeah. You see, you, it's you taking up a knife and me taking up a djembe, and we are fighting. Some people say there is influence, external influence. There could be, but we can say no to that influence. Do you understand what I mean? I agree. That it is us with the power to say what we want mm -hmm. with ourselves and our lives and our country and our continent, you see. And so can we do that? Because tomorrow I don't want to keep talking about, that is why sometimes I feel like that's why maybe there's so much apathy from the world because of oh, what's new about Africa. Every time you mention Africa, what comes to people's mind? It's poverty, <laughs> it's conflict, you know. Someone it's said, nice. have you seen Bono? <laughs> have you seen UNICEF? You know, they say that when UNICEF is not in Europe, UNICEF is in Africa. Yeah. You know, and so I'm like, I want to tell a story of a thriving Africa. And of every day, children are born in this continent. They're born into what? Into poverty and conflict? Can we have kids born into a continent full of promises? You know? I also want, if, if one of my kids de decides to follow my footsteps, yeah. I want them to tell a story of a developed Africa. Yes. You know? When they, when, when, they, when they tell story, historical stories, they say, we used to have. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and tell you what, the places in Africa where I've been, most times I've traveled to very remote parts of Africa. Actually, that's where most of my assignments take me. But I'm always blown away by how those people live and how they survive. You know, we talk about tech and how tech has improved our lives, but you need to see the human ingenuity that is with those people. They have no tech, but any of those people have ways of surviving. When I was in Chad, on the eastern side of Chad with the border in Sudan, that was in the desert. And people sleep outside because of how hot it is 
so they can't be able to sleep in the house. But you know what? It's full of scorpions out there, but they know how to deal with that poison from the scorpion should you get bitten at night. Mm -hmm. And they know what to do with the venom from a snake. Do you get? With minimal resources. What does that tell you? It tells you how sharp our people are. You see? And so if we could only facilitate these people to sharpen more on the already, their already existing knowledge within them, then you can see where Africa would be. I've been to Trukana and then you find someone doesn't have a mattress mm. in, in that hut, the Manyata there. Masa is called it Manyata. I don't know how Trukana has called it. Um, can't remember. But in that hut there, they don't have a mattress. Yeah. They sleep on sand. But they survive. Yeah. I saw I get your point. Yeah. They survive. Yes. Without anything. But they do. Because they have this knowledge within them. And all we need to do is just empower these people. You know? But when I was in Burkina Faso, for instance, in 2020, <laughs> people were displaced from their homes. And so they went some area called Barcelona, very far near the border with Mali. Yes. And kids are striving to get an education, even while they're displaced. And they were learning under a tree. And it was in February, so it was during the Hamatan season. The Hamatan is when there's these winds that blow in the desert and they carry with them lots of sand. And I'm telling you, Enoch, those winds would come and it would all of a sudden get dark at 2 p.m. and you don't see anything. It's cloud, clouded by sand yes. or something. Like the sun is literally blocked by, by the amounts of sand, yes, that is in the air. So it gets dark. Kuna kagiza, kabisa, but it's just sand in the air. You cannot breathe. I saw the same thing in Chad when I was there last year. You can't breathe. You can't even open your eyes because the dust gets into your eyes. It gets everywhere. And these small children, Enoch, still striving to get an education. And I'm talking about, I'm not talking about teenagers. Small kids, five years, with their little backpacks branded UNICEF, are under a tree, scrambling, first of all, it's an arid area. So trees, but they'll sit and squeeze themselves there with those donkeys that their displaced families use to get water from, I don't know, 10 kilometers away. So and the kids are learning and the dust will come and those small children will struggle to breathe and even blink and they will wait it out. Then we're in the Kusoma. And I'll tell you something I saw in Chad last year. Mm -hmm. I traveled again with JP, and we went to this camp. Um, remember I told you that the crisis was unfolding, so as it's unfolding, UNHCR is also trying to, to deal with the numbers and take care of these people coming in. And we went to do a story about what the UNHCR was doing. You know, basically they're constructing, they were actually overwhelmed by the influx of the refugees. And we went to this camp, and we saw this, this small, two little boys. They had just come, they had, the family had just been assigned a house. I think they'd been there for, I think a day, they had arrived a day before. Yes. And JP was carrying the tripod on his shoulder. He had a small camera, so the camera is hanging and the tripod is up. And he was walking, so he approaches this small boy. The boys were two. And that boy was about, perhaps maybe about six years, they're about, couldn't have been more than seven years. He'd been left with his small brother. So he sees JP with a tripod and this boy runs away screaming. He tries to carry his small brother, but now he's not able to, you know? So he dumps the little brother and he runs away screaming. And JP is speaking to him in French and he's trying to tell him, hey, where are you going? Why are you going away? Why are you crying? And the boy runs and runs. And there were two men seated a, a short distance away. He ran towards the men. So the men saw this boy. They heard the boy screaming and they saw the boy running. And so what they got up naturally. They want to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And the boy gets to them and the boy talks. He's crying. He's pointing at JP. And then the men come to us and they say, oh, he's running away because of the tripod. The tripod, it looks like a gun. And... So we are told they just arrived and a lot of people were killed and to him that represented death. So when he saw the tripod in his head, 
he couldn't differentiate between a tripod and okay. a gun. So JP had now to, in the presence of this guy, had now to talk to this little boy, show him the camera, mount it on the tripod to show him it is not really a weapon. It is not a gun. It is but you see the trauma. You see the trauma, Enoch, mm -hmm. that Africans are carrying with them. Yes. This child was no more than, I dare say six years, you know, but he already knows a gun equals death. And that is what he's going to carry through in his life as he grows older. And that's what I was talking about. We can't have people getting born into conflict and dying into that conflict, th living through it and dying into it. Like we have to change honestly. Thank you so much, Perina. That has been Perina Karibe, our first guest and on this series, the first episode. I know you've loved it. Um, she has some devastating stories to tell. But there is hope. She says there is hope. And as Africans, we must look into a future. But it has to start with us. We have to fight and we have to push for a better Africa. This is Surviving to Tell the Story, a series told by Africans who have been on the front line, who have seen it all and telling as it was. My name is Enoch Sikolia, and I am the Kenyan historian.